Did you know that burning to death is the most painful way to be killed? But I imagine being burned in the open is not as painful as burning in an enclosed space. Picture this. You're enclosed in a room with all exits tightly clasped from the outside, and a fire begins. You first experience that rush of adrenaline, spiked by fear and the need to survive. You try looking for a means of escape, but can find none. You then notice you're having difficulty breathing because of the smoke clogging your lungs. At this point, you start feeling the heat from the flames they grow towards you, and then the beams on the roof start to crash down as they're weakened by the flames. The flames then engulf you, burning off your skin slowly inch by painful inch. You could die from the shock of the pain if you had not already been suffocated to death. Finally, imagine that you had not been the only one in that room, but you had been there with 68 others. You guessed it, mass panic, in which case some people may have died after being stepped on by others. This is exactly what happened in the Wrightsville Negro Boys Industrial School fire in 1959 that caused the deaths of 21 teenage boys between the ages of 13 and 17. The school existed during the Jim Crow era in Arkansas. This was the era where laws were passed to encourage mass segregation of black Americans from white Americans. Laws were all justified by the incorrect belief that black people were intrinsically inferior to white people. Founded in 1923, the Arkansas Negro Boys Industrial School was, for most of its existence, a juvenile work farm located first outside Pine Bluff, Jefferson County, and then, in the mid-1930s, outside of Wrightsville. The school was purportedly a school of reform for juvenile delinquents, where they were supposed to be taught trades to improve themselves. The teens there had been incarcerated for homelessness, petty theft, and pranks. One boy had been caught soaping windows during Halloween. Many boys who were products of broken homes had also been turned over by their parents. By many accounts, however, the school was more akin to a prison farm, complete with whippings and poor hygiene. Gordon Morgan documented some of the living conditions in Negro Boys Industrial School. He said, Many boys would go for days with only rags for clothes. More than half of them wore neither socks nor underwear during the winter of 1955-1956. It was not uncommon to see youths going for weeks without bathing or changing clothes. He also noted that all the buildings were in dire need of repair, especially the boys' living quarters. At times, the number of boys at the school was over 100. There was no laundry equipment. For a population of about 100 boys, only a single 30-gallon hot water tank was available to serve their bathing needs. The water was deemed undrinkable, and most employees brought their own drinking water to work. Gordon Morgan equally wrote in his master's thesis on Negro Boys Industrial School that in an earlier era, armed guards had overseen the boys in the fields, and boys were whipped with a leather strap for infractions. On the 5th of March, 1959, at 4 a.m., the so-called Big Boys Dorm at Negro Boys Industrial School was set ablaze when all were asleep. The boys who had been padlocked in the dormitory tried to claw their way out by prying off mesh-covered metal screens from two windows. 48 boys survived, while 21 others were not so lucky. The next morning, the bodies of 21 black boys were found piled on top of each other in a corner of the burned dormitory. Press reports called it the Holocaust, an apt appellation for what is until today the worst fire record ever in Arkansas history. Two of the dead boys were only 13 years old. One of the boys, William Lloyd Piggy of DeWitt, had been sent to Wrightsville after he'd been seen riding a bike that belonged to a white boy. The white boy's mum had reported the bike stolen, but after her son told her he had lent it to his friend, she tried to clear up the misunderstanding. But the police insisted that the bike was stolen. Frank Lawrence, who was only four years old, when his brother, 15-year-old Lindsey Cross, died in the fire, struggled against all odds to investigate the fire many years later. He said it was a carefully calculated murder that involved 21 boys, but was designed to kill 69, and that very few knew 
This happened because of the ability of the state of Arkansas to do an impressive job at covering it up. Lindsey Cross, Frank's older brother, was barely 15 when he was trapped by the fire. He'd been sent to Wrightsville after a neighbor of the Lawrences in the Thai plant area of North Little Rock told authorities he'd stolen money from a store's cash register while two other boys distracted the white owner. Luvenia Lawrence said she could only remember going to an office before her son was sent to Wrightsville. It seemed strong to her that there had been no trial. That apparently was the way of things at the time. It took a lawsuit, filed by Griff Stockley for legal aid in the late 1980s, to create legal redress for juveniles in Arkansas. Until then, county judges had jurisdiction, appointing referees, usually not lawyers, to decide the fate of juveniles. Of the 21 boys burned to death on that gloomy day, 14 were burnt beyond recognition, while only 7 were recognized and given private funerals. The 14 were buried five days after the fire, their interment paid for by the state of Arkansas. Their charred remains lay side by side and unmarked in a mass grave at Haven of Rest Cemetery on 12th Street. Who could we possibly blame for the death of these 21 boys? According to Governor Orville Faubus, Lester R. Gaines, the black superintendent, was solely responsible. Gaines, he implied, had failed to ensure the safety of the boys by having an employee at the building at night in case of emergency. This was clearly an attempt to remove whatever blame may have been cast at his door. Seeing as, in the past year, while on a visit to Negro Boys Industrial School, he had publicly noted its deteriorating condition, but had failed to propose an increase in appropriations to address the issue. Not that the employees were completely free of blame. They had been negligent and excessively remiss in their duties. How could there be a fire and no one there to open the two doors of the dormitory to let their wards escape? But of course, the majority of the blame should be on the government, who were knowingly segregating black Americans from white Americans and giving the white people more privileges and attention than the black Americans. Such inequality is seen clearly in the biennial report to the governor, which noted the following vocational trades taught at Pine Bluff White Boys Reform School. Carpentry and joining, cabinet work, glazing, painting cement work, bricklaying, wood and metal lathe operation, blacksmithing, acetylene welding, plastering, tailoring, and shoe mending. While at Negro Boys Industrial School, all they saw fit for the Negro Boys to do was farming. And all the government cared about was the yield the school produced, giving no thought to the maintenance of the infrastructure. On the night of the fire, the institution for white boys in Pine Bluff had two house parents on duty, and the doors at that institution were not locked at night. The governor told reporters that Wrightsville had a high incidence of escapes, which accounted for the difference in policy. A whole lot of balderdash, if you ask me. If the living conditions were any better, there would not be as many attempts at escape. Governor Orval Faubus admitted five weeks after the fire that faulty wiring could have contributed to the fire. This made sense, considering the report from the Little Rock Fire Department stating that the fire probably started in the attic above the empty caretaker's room, off the classroom, and close to the entrance to the dorm. And the fact that one of the students had been killed by a falling beam close to the entrance to the dorm and all the other bodies were found in a pile at one corner far away from the door. The Little Rock Fire Department had initially refused to send help when they had been called, saying that the school was outside city limits. I guess this would count if the school fell under some other jurisdiction. But shouldn't human life come with protocols, jurisdictions, and geographical boundaries? How the bereaved bore the pain, we probably will never know. And to make matters worse, the bereaved families were offered a mere pittance for the loss of their beloved children. The sums reportedly ranged between three three hundred dollars and five nine hundred dollars, and even when given so little, the white attorneys who represented the families received as much as fifty percent of the damages awarded by the commission. In the end, 
Many were said to be responsible for the fire, but none was held liable. A Pulaski County grand jury questioned witnesses, but returned no criminal indictments. Clearly, the fire had caused embarrassment in the state. Its citizens, however, generally saw the deaths of the 21 boys not as a consequence of the state's continuing commitment to the policy of white supremacy, but rather as a result of negligence. Meanwhile, reactions to the deaths of the boys from outside Arkansas at the time of the fire were in sharp contrast to the response of people living inside the state. This is not unsurprising because the people living in Arkansas were probably accustomed to such occurrences. Governor Faubus received multiple letters from outside the state, one even from London, all condemning the racialist behavior in Arkansas and its Jim Crow laws. We won't forget the toll these events must have had on the mental health of the survivors. The survivors of the fire must have had to watch the others burn, hearing their screams of pain and terror. Some probably felt a little guilt for having lived where others died the true definition of post-traumatic stress disorder. The wife of one of the survivors later said, in an interview before her husband's death from cancer, that he had continued to dream about the fire. In 2018, approximately 60 years after the fire, a memorial plaque listing the names of the boys who died was placed on a stone near the location of the 14 boys' unmarked graves in Haven of Rest Cemetery. Frank Lawrence intended to make a documentary film about the event. He took the story to print and television media in Little Rock. Two TV stations have aired interviews with Lawrence and he worked with the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center to record the story there. Frank Lawrence thinks the more people know about what happened in 1959, the more they'll take an interest in what's going on today. Thanks for watching. Join us in our mission to honor the memory of those who suffered and ensure their stories are heard. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we explore untold stories uncovering the truths that have been buried for far too long.